Um, wait, okay, uh, we, we're live. Okay, so <laughs> hello to the session. Um, my name is Eike Langbein and this is a locomotion session. Uh, we have six speakers, no, six talks, but five speakers. Um, and the speakers are Esteban Segarra from University of Central Florida, Naya Williams from University of Maryland, Richard Paris from Verizon Wireless, Jonathan Kelly from Iowa State University, and uh, Maddie Esmendian from University of Southern California. And we will um, first listen to our talks and in the end we have a Q&A session. So the first speaker is um, Esteban. Let's see. All right. Uh, so, all right. My name is Tansana Martins, and today I shall be presenting my systematic review uh, titled Research Trends in Virtual Reality Locomotion Techniques. Um, yeah. So, uh, locomotion continues to be a challenge for virtual reality. Um, and in particular, um, virtual reality researchers and developers are creating hundreds of different locomotion techniques, and at the same time, uh, different solutions for them. Uh, over the years, many of these techniques have created a trend towards uh, which uh, we're trying to locate where this trend is going. As such, uh, we created a systematic review and are kind of uh, trying to locate where the trend is going. So we're using a locomotion taxonomy, uh, uh, which is Bowman et al. 2004, in order to classify the different techniques that we we're being countering. Uh, and we're applying a k-means clustering algorithm in order to determine to what extent different locomotion techniques and metrics have been explored. We're respectively categorizing them as either a high or moderate or less explored condition. Uh, the motivation in general then is to just to try to see where uh, the techniques and metrics are moving towards and what needs more work or exploration. So to begin our systematic review, we have a couple of questions, uh, which uh, locomotion techniques have been highly explored, whether it's explored or less explored. Similarly, uh, locomotion metrics have the same um, status. So to begin our, our uh, systematic review, we began with a web of science search. I used a couple of keywords, which are virtual reality, uh, BR, locomotion, travel, etc. And initially, we got 141 results on our initial search. We then reviewed the abstracts and uh, cut down the number of publications down to 91 papers. And then we applied an inclusion exclusion criteria in order to further uh, reduce this number down to 63 papers. So uh, our systematic review essentially was a criteria of the following sort. Um, at least a user study with reported measurements had to be dependent on the locomotion uh, criteria, uh, explicitly compare one or more locomotion techniques or focus on the effects of a new locomotion technique and exclude publications that had duplicate results uh, in their, in their uh, publication. So we then generally began with uh, creating the categories for our, uh, for our search. Uh, and specifically, I are now applying the Bauman's uh, taxonomy uh, in order to uh, sort out everything. So uh, we created five, uh, from Bowman's uh, taxonomy, we could have uh, five categories that we were looking at, specifically looking at blocking-based uh, locomotion techniques, steam based locomotion techniques, selection-based uh, techniques, manipulation-based, and automated. Uh, respectively, in this paper, we'll be looking at highly explored as H, moderately explored as M, and less explored as L. And this is referred in the uh, diagrams that we'll be looking at. So uh, in order to classify them, we're using the K-means algorithm uh, to classify them in the clusters. 
uh, and specifically we'll be using the scikit-learn based implementation, uh, which was created using the default settings. And again, we'll be classifying this in as a high moderate or low explosion uh, classification. So to base on our results, uh, we'll begin with the walking based locomotion uh, techniques. So these are any uh, commotion techniques in which the user's body is, uh, has, uh, the user's physical body is moved around the environment, which re is reflected in the virtual environment. So at the beginning, we have, we have found that the walking in place locomotion techniques was the most investigated technique as seen in the uh, pie chart to the right here. Uh, and in runner up, uh, the redirected walking was also the second most investigated walking technique. Uh, all of the other uh, walking based locomotion techniques was then found to be less than explored. And so there are a couple of other techniques that could have been uh, considered moderately explored, but these first two were the most uh, investigated. We then look at steering-based locomotion. Uh, in here, uh, steering-based locomotion is considered to be whenever the user continuously specifies the direction of travel. So as seen here, joystick-directed steering was by far the most investigated steering technique. Um, in follow-up to that, head-directed steering was the second most investigated steering technique in this category. However, this uh, was still half the uh, count as the most dominant one which was joystick directed steering, and all other steering techniques were found to be less explored. So in continuation today, we'll look at manipulation-based and automation-based um, locomotion. So manipulation-based is whenever the user specifies a location or uh, actually controls their position in the virtual environment. And automated locomotion techniques are whenever the user control, whenever the user has less control and the system is actually controlling the user's movements. I think here, um, most or all, all of the uh, techniques here were classified to be uh, less than explored. So, uh, we're found by with Kai kind of means. So um, next we'll look at the locomotion metrics. So in here we can see that uh, a couple of things to note. Uh, travel performance metrics were by far the uh, highly most explored uh, metrics. So travel performance metrics are whenever uh, we're using a quantitative uh, value or some uh, values such as time error or distance errors as a uh, trial performance metric. And whenever we're using perceived usability, um, whenever when the next category, the perceived usability, is whenever we're using something like a systematic usability scale by Brook and L, which is basically trying to determine whether a system uh, technique is usable or not. The other one, which we found to be uh, discomfort metrics, uh, this is more like systematic six simulator sickness questionnaire by Kennedy et al. This was also um, very fun to be um, literally explored. Uh, moving on, uh, we'll have a discussion about uh, findings. So essentially found that point teleport and joystick stream were extensively explored. Uh, walking in place and redirected walking and head directed steering were moderately explored. And we have found a couple of less explored techniques that are now appearing in consumer VR games to be um, now being coming more popular. So our here our notice that uh, of these less explored techniques that are now becoming popular, um, we can try to see why these techniques are becoming popular and could be a future area of research that can be more investigated in the future. So. And in concluding with the locomotion metrics, um, travel performance metrics were by far the most highly explored in research. Perceived usability and discomfort metrics were moderately explored. And now we're looking at the ones that were less explored. 
in particular, we are talking about uh, metrics such as biometrics, user experience, emotions. Um, and then we are also finding that non-standard questionnaires are very frequently used, which creates the concern that some of the uh, results that are generated from non-standard questionnaires to be not validatable, potentially unreliable, and not generalizable, which is a concern when we're trying to uh, determine the values from, uh, from a, a particular uh, locomotion technique. Uh, that will be the conclusion of my talk, and thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks. So next speaker, can you please share your screen? Hello. I'm, uh, you can see my slides, right? I will just assume, yeah. Yes. Okay, great. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Niall Williams. I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland, and I'll be talking about quantifying environment compatibility for natural walking in VR. So with VR, Usually we want to let the user explore the virtual environment using natural locomotion because it has lots of benefits for things like sense of presence. But this is not always possible because uh, some paths in the virtual environment that may be valid may correspond to obstructed paths in the physical environment that may lead to collisions with objects. And so given that this is the case, the next natural question to ask is, well, how much natural locomotion is possible for some given pair of environments? But it turns out that answering this question is pretty difficult to do without conducting lots of user studies to collect some locomotion data. And as an example, so consider this pair of environments. If the user wants to walk straight forward uh, in VR, they can't do so because they're blocked by a fireplace in the real world. But if they want to walk forward and then take a right turn, they'd be able to do so because the physical space allows for it. And so answering the question of how much natural locomotion is possible basically boils down to doing this sort of path analysis, but for every single possible path in every possible starting position combination. And that's just intractable to compute. But we can take a little bit of a shortcut and we can look towards uh, navigability to help us out. So environment navigability is what we define here as the average distance walked before colliding with an obstacle in the physical space. So uh, an environment that has lots of open space with very few obstacles would have high navigability, whereas an environment that's very cluttered with lots of objects around the place would have low nav navigability. And where our work makes its contribution is that we come up with a metric to estimate the navigability of a pair of physical and virtual environments for locomotion in VR. So some prior work has looked at uh, navigation, navigability metrics, but they were in the space of like robotics or environmental psychology. And so those works were only concerned with one agent in one environment, whereas the VR problem has one agent in two environments. So it's a little bit different. So how do we do this? So first, we need to quantify the salient features of the environment that are relevant for locomotion. And then we need to be able to compare these features. And the idea here is that if the environments are more similar, it's more likely that collision-free locomotion will be possible because the paths will correspond nicely. And so similarity can be used as a proxy for navigability. So if we get some input geometry, which is basically just a floor plan of the physical and virtual environments, we can then sample uniformly across both environments. And then we can compute a visibility polygon for every single point that we sample. And we use visibility polygons because they're a very clean way to represent the uh, structure of an environment around some point. And since we sampled so many, what we end up with is these two lists of polygons, one for each environment. And these lists, you can think of them like the signature of the environment. So since we sampled enough points uniformly, uh, these lists pretty much uniquely identify the structure of an environment. And so now the next step is being able to compare these two lists of polygons. And I'll run through an example of how we do this. So if we take an, a polygon from the physical environment, which you show here in blue, uh, and then we compare with a polygon from the virtual environment shown in red, uh, what we care about is which regions of space in the virtual environment are inaccessible from our current position in the physical environment. And that's actually given in this uh, diagram, it's given as all the regions that we highlight here in gold, which are the regions of the virtual or red that don't overlap with the physical or the blue polygon. And so our similarity metric for two polygons will just be the area of this shaded region. And so we compute the minimum area for each pair of points, uh, polygons in each across the environments. And what we end up with is a big list of numbers, uh, which is the final uh, metric that we come up with. But like I said, it's a big list of numbers and that's really not easily interpretable um, for humans at least. So 
to help with the interpretation of our uh, metrics so that we can actually use it for something useful, uh, we can do some visualizations. So here we have plotted out all the points that we sampled for the virtual environments, and then we color them according to uh, their similarity scores. So the best matching similarity. Um, and here yellow is worse. So yellow means low navigability and uh, blue or purple is better. So it means higher navigability for the given uh, physical environment. And what we can see in this uh, diagram is actually something that we actually know from intuition already, which is that virtual spaces that are very uh, expansive and open with few obstacles are generally harder to do collision-free locomotion in um, compared to environments in the virtual world that have less free space um, to walk in, especially when the physical environment is similarly cluttered. And so we can also do a sort of interactive visualization where we can select uh, particular points and see where do they map to in the physical space. And in this, in this example, we can see that along the horizontal corridor, which is much longer, uh, we consistently score highly on the incompatibility scale. So navigability is worse. But along the vertical axis, where the dimensions are the same, we score uh, pretty well in terms of navigability. So we also did some validations to make sure that uh, we weren't just imagining things and that our metric does indeed tell us something interesting. So what we did was we collected locomotion data from both user studies and simulations in 15 different pairs of environments. And then we computed the average distance walk between collisions with obstacles for those, those data. And then we also computed the uh, average ENI score or the metric score across all different uh, environment pairs. And what we saw was that generally, as the metric score increased, so as the navigability got worse, uh, indeed, the user was able to walk only a shorter distance before colliding with an obstacle. So they had a, a tougher time doing collision-free navigation. So we didn't see this trend for every single pair of environments that we tested, but we saw it for most of them. So it does seem like uh, our metric is indeed telling us something interesting about locomotion behavior in the environment. And the key, important, the key part here is that we were able to do this, it, com com compute the ENI score without actually collecting any locomotion data. We only used that data for the validation, but our metric doesn't need any locomotion data to compute this and still tell us something interesting. So this work does have some limitations. First, the computations can be slow depending on the detail of your environment. In our work, the worst case was about six minutes per environment pair. And we also only provide a best case mapping between the physical and virtual environments, but that may not always be suitable, um, especially for things like uh, maybe a path analysis where you have specific uh, locations that you have to be in. Um, we also only consider the layouts of environments for this work, but it's known that there are other factors that also contribute to navigability. So future models could incorporate those. And of course, more data would always be helpful. So to wrap things up, I hope I was able to show you all that comparing the similarity of the physical and virtual environments is useful for understanding and analyzing locomotion in virtual reality. Um, hopefully I showed that accurate estimates of navigability can also help with the design of virtual experiences and environments. I'd also like to say that I think there's lots of room for growth in this area by levering, leveraging other ideas from uh, fields like robotics, geometry, and environmental psychology. And future work should look to things like parallelization, different metrics for similarity, um, incorporating more factors and more data. Thank you very much for your time. If you're interested, you can find more at the, like the paper and code at those links. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach me at that email. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, next speaker is Richard Paris. Okay. Uh, my name is Richard Paris, and I will be presenting on evaluating the impact of limited physical space on the navigation performance of two locomotion methods in immersive virtual environments done at Vanderbilt. So I wanna go over the coverage. We're gonna go into some background information. I'm gonna move into the locomotion methods we use and our lab setup, start to talk about the spatial navigation task and some results on that, as well as some individual differences results and then conclude with a few words. So, um, there are a number of locomotion methods throughout VR that provide differing idiothetic cues. And for the purpose of this paper, we wanna look at how those locomotion methods uh, provide proprioceptive cues and vestibular cues. Works such as Rike et al. and Ruddle et al. have shown that these cues can help improve the amount of spatial knowledge one can acquire. And this can be affected by the complexity of the environment. And we have a particularly complex environment. In this work, we seek to employ spatial learning as a tool to sort of measure the realism of the locomotion method. That is to determine the method by which a subject can achieve the highest level of spatial knowledge. In order to do this, we look at the uh, model proposed by Siegel and White 
and how Crastill and Warren applied that model in a spatial learning task. We're gonna use that task to evaluate how well each method affords the acquisition of spatial knowledge. And since we're looking at spatial knowledge, I want to stress the importance of individual differences. And we know from work like Haggerty 2002 et al and others that a number of factors can affect performance in these tasks greatly. So we wanna make sure to consider those. The two locomotion methods that we use are resetting and walking in place. And these two were chosen as they fit our lab, our space very well in its limited space. And they still provide uh, as strong and as many cues as possible. Now this paper looks at how locomotion is affected by limiting the space available. Since we have a roughly four meter by four meter tract space in our lab, um, and this space closely corresponds to that of the entry level VR systems like the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift, we find these two to be suitable for our lab. So for the other conditions, we also have a three by three resetting and a two by two resetting. And instead of using a one by one meter space for resetting, which would be very cumbersome, we include a walking in place condition. And this allows us to have some baseline against which we can compare the point at which resetting provides, uh, no longer provides a benefit. Uh, we can also see if smaller spaces become too small to adequately allow resetting. So now I wanna go over the task that we are, are doing in order to test how well people are learning. So. First, there are 140 participants recruited for this experiment and 26 completed each of those conditions mentioned before. We recruited 58 male, 82 female. So in the first phase, subjects are presented with a uh, practice maze. And in this practice maze, they're given five minutes to sort of explore and learn their method of walking to understand resetting, to understand walking in place. The second phase is a learning phase. They are then tasked with learning the layouts of the maze. They are told to go explore and find the eight objects and that they will be tested on the relative locations of those objects, but they were not given exact details on the exact, on the task. That way they are not practicing the task, but learning the maze. Finally, we have the testing phase. Subjects are placed back in the maze, presented with one of the eight objects, as well as the maze to allow themselves to orient and have some knowledge of the other locations, the lo object's locations. Finally, they are presented with a task, a goal object. They are told, please go to this object. So they are told to face that object and walk there in a single straight line. That gives us um, one of the more important measurements, angular error. Angular error, is the angle between the walked path and the correct path and represents sort of their configural uh, angular knowledge of the environment, okay? So if they walk you know, north and it's 15 degrees left of north, that's a 15 degree error. So as you see here, there were significant differences between the walking in place condition and the two by two and three by three condition in which they did much worse in the two by two and three by three resetting condition, indicating that you know, at some level, uh, resetting becomes too small to compete with walking in place in terms of angular error. There was no statistical difference between four by four and walking in place, and we'll discuss what that means uh, at the end of this. Now, I wanna briefly summarize for brevity the individual differences, and I encourage you to go to our paper to find uh, more information about all of them. But we see that angular error was correlated with mental rotation ability and sense of direction, indicating that people who have better ability to rotate objects in their mind or tend to think their sense of direction is better, perform better at this task. We also found that walked distance was not correlated with any measures of individual difference. And walked distance uh, roughly corresponds to how big the person uh, thought the environment was. And none of the ones that we measured seem to correlate with that. Uh, we also found that working memory as measured by the Corsi block tapping test showed no, no correlation. So at least in terms of the uh, block tapping, um, there was no effect of one's ability to memorize things. We also found there was no effect of gender and in a lot of tasks, we do see um, some effects of gender in this one, we found none. So now I will conclude with some final words and uh, leave you with some takeaways some future directions here. So again, we found that walking in place yielded significantly better acquisition of knowledge than resetting in those smaller tract spaces, the three by three meter, the two by two meter. 
but we found that there was no statistical difference by for the four by four meter. Now there was some difference. And so that leads to the question, is there a large enough space that there is that um, performs better than walking in place for angular error? Is there a space at which you no longer have that benefit of not having to reset? Now you see, we also quantified in some way the cognitive cost to resetting in terms of the acquisition of spatial knowledge. We found that more resets led to worse spatial knowledge, right? If there's a smaller space, they're forced to reset more, their spatial knowledge went down. Again, similar to the last point, is there some minimum or maximum uh, to this cost, right? Is there some lower level where they, you know, stop losing spatial knowledge, but still have some ability to remember the, the layout? And finally, uh, the most important future work, I think, is to continue to look at these individual differences. Can we look at ways to use individual differences to choose a locomotion method or provide cues to help some learners? And I encourage you to look through our paper to see our thoughts on this. Uh, again, I'm Richard Paris, and I'd like to thank you all for coming to this talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jonathan Kelly. All right, thank you. I'm John Kelly. Uh, I'll be talking today about remote research on locomotion interfaces for virtual reality, replication of a lab-based study on teleporting interfaces. Uh, this is work done with colleagues at Iowa State University. Now, the motivation for this work stemmed primarily from a desire to conduct remote research on VR locomotion interfaces. Uh, and the benefit that we were most focused on was safety of our researchers and participants and during the pandemic. Um, there are many other potential benefits to conducting research remotely. Um, I won't go into those today, but we discussed them in the paper. Our research question was whether data collected from remote participants uh, would replicate lab-based data on navigation performance when teleporting. So we collected new data from a remote participant sample using their own VR equipment in their own space. Um, we compared their performance to that of lab participants. Um, we had previously collected these data and previously published them as well. So we included 42 participants uh, recruited through Amazon's Mechanical Turk, MTurk, uh, and Prolific, which is an online work site kind of like MTurk. Uh, participants performed repeated trials of a triangle completion task in which they traveled along an outbound path marked by a sequence of three posts, a green one, a yellow one, and then a red one. And then at the end of the path, they pointed back as best they could to the path origin or the location of the green post. We had three primary independent variables. These were all within participant manipulations. Uh, the first was the path size. So the triangle size could either be larger or smaller. We also manipulated the environment size, which could be smaller or larger. And I'll show you some pictures of these in a moment. And we utilized two different locomotion interfaces, in particular, two teleporting interfaces. And I'll describe those in more detail now. So the first teleporting interface is one that everyone's familiar with here. Uh, we call it partially concordant teleporting. This is where the user teleports to translate, uh, but then turns the body to rotate. So here, the Participant teleports to the green post that marks the beginning of the path. They then turn their body to face the yellow post and teleport to it, rotate to face the red post, teleport to it, and then attempt to point back to the position of the green post or the path origin. Um, so we call this partially concordant teleporting because some of the movements, especially the rotations, are in, in agreement with or concordant with movement of the self, whereas the translational piece is not in agreement with movement of the self. Um, this video also showed a large triangle in the small virtual environment. And you'll see that the travel space is relatively close to those uh, landmarks at the periphery of the environment. The second interface we used we call discordant teleporting. This is where the user teleports to both translate and to rotate. Um, so here they position and orient this pink triangle to match the position and orientation 
shown at the base of each post. So here they're not rotating at all, um, or, nor are they walking. And so it's completely discordant with movement of the self. Um, this video also shows a large triangle in the large virtual environment. And you'll see they're pretty far away from the um, landmarks that are at the periphery of the space. Some demographics of our participants, uh, remote participants were mostly men, uh, 37 men, four women, one declined to state. Um, this is in contrast to the lab-based participants um, that we were from our previous study in which we included um, 19 men and 18 women. Our remote participants uh, played VR games regularly, um, uh, mostly weekly and some monthly. Uh, we don't have similar data for our, our lab-based participants. Um, our online participants also played video games an average of 29 hours a week. And unfortunately, we don't have comparable data for our lab participants. Um, I'll be presenting the performance data in terms of uh, absolute angular error. That's the absolute distance between the direction of their response and the direction of the correct location or the green post. So here on the y-axis uh, is absolute angular error uh, for uh, the partially concordant teleporting data first. Uh, blue bars are lab participants, green bars are remote participants. And the first thing you should see is that the green and blue bars are very similar to each other. Um, not only are they close in height, uh, but they also show the same pattern um, where there's one condition uh, where uh, errors are rather low compared to the other three. That's the large path and the small virtual environment. Uh, we think that the reason that condition's easier is that it leads participants relatively close to the landmarks. And so it enables landmark-based navigation uh, compared to the other three more challenging conditions. These are data from the discordant teleporting interface. That's where they teleport to translate and rotate. Um, here, uh, the, again, the blue bars represent uh, lab-based data, green bars are remote participant data. Um, the, here we see some divergence between the two groups, uh, the blue and green. In particular, in the three most difficult conditions, the green bars are just a little bit better than the blue bars. Uh, remote participants are doing just a little bit better. Um, but when you get into the easier condition, that is the one um, the large path and the small virtual environment, the two groups perform more similarly. So some quick conclusions here. Uh, the remote data in general were quite similar to the lab data uh, in the sense that the effects of these different manipulations were very similar. The teleporting interface manipulation, path size and VE size all produce similar effects. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, of course, some of the details um, that I pointed out to you did differ. Um, I noted that the remote participants perform better with this more difficult teleporting interface in the absence of nearby landmarks. Um, so moving forward, we think that many lab-based findings on locomotion interfaces are likely to replicate in a remote setting, uh, but not all of them will. Um, and in some cases, demographic differences between lab and remote uh, may be more important. Um, so we've decided to proceed cautiously with remote research on locomotion interfaces, taking opportunities like this to replicate known findings uh, from lab research. And by doing this, we can continue to make research strides in an online setting uh, and potentially ask even more interesting questions down the line um, that take advantage of differences between the remote uh, and lab samples. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for this talk. Um, so now we have our last speaker, Mehdi, and he will present two papers. Hey, all right. Got some blood representation here first. All right, this is, do we have everything shared? Do we see everything and everything? And say yes. Yes. Perfect. Well, this is we're re reaching the end of the session, so I think this is the part we're running low on time, and things are going to pick up quite a bit. Okay. Hi, my name is Maddie Osmandion. The title of this talk is "Adaptive Redirection: A Context-Aware Redirected Walking Meta Strategy." This will be an attempt to summarize seven years of my life in seven minutes, which is both challenging and painfully humbling. 
Before we jump in, I do want to mention that I work for Sony Interactive Entertainment, which you might know as PlayStation. I'm part of a team called Magic Lab, and we're currently hiring. So if you love playing, designing, and thinking about video games, you should check us out. And boom. This talk is trying to address a very practical problem, designing the optimal redirection strategy. We have a variety of techniques for how to use redirection to keep users within the confines of the physical space, but among them all, we still don't really know which one to use. And that's what we're trying to answer here. To kill the suspense and offer an undramatic reveal, it turns out there is no single redirection strategy that's generally applicable and optimal. But if you can understand each of these approaches and how they perform in different conditions, you can select the best choice given the context. And that's the principal philosophy of this work. In the interest of time, I'm going to assume the audience members are familiar with the concept of using redirection to subtly keep users within the confines of the physical space and how resets are used as a fail-safe mechanism to keep users contained when unnoticeable redirection is not sufficient. So we have three categories of redirection strategies. First, we need to identify within each category which outperforms the rest to represent that category. Then the choice of which of the three candidates we need to go with is determined by the adaptive meta strategy. So at each moment in time, the, during the virtual experience, the system first scans to identify the context, then it refers to its adaptation rules, kind of like a lookup table that says, okay, this situation calls for using a general strategy or dynamic planning or static planning. Developing the adaptation rules requires a deep understanding of the performance of each redirection strategy and how they're influenced by the context. This knowledge is obtained by using an evaluation framework that makes this analysis possible. I'll be talking about this framework in the next talk. The paper goes into more detail about categories of redirection strategies. It also introduces a static planning strategy called copper, which is optimized for redirection in linear experiences. The paper also goes into detail about the evaluation framework and how we use simulations and the frequency of resets to gauge performance. In the interest of time, I'll be just focusing on identifying context and how to use the evaluation framework to derive the adaptation rules. As for defining what context is for redirection, we can imagine a variety of elements, the virtual narrative restrictions and objective, the user intention and goals, and also the architectural layout of the environment. With these in mind, we define the notion of a prediction graph, which lends itself to our notion of context in this work. A prediction graph essentially looks at the user's movement in the virtual environment to identify the user's navigation options. Here, the user can go up or down and from there turn left or right. Here we see an illustration of the prediction graph being generated dynamically, taking into account the users, the environment obstacles and the user's movement history. This video is, is from a preliminary algorithm and more recent work has refined the quality of the prediction graph generation. Now with this defined, we define context based on the properties of our prediction graph. But how do we quantify the properties of this graph? We have chosen three, segment length distribution, expressing the distance between consecutive waypoints, turn angle distribution, which is the amount the user needs to turn after reaching one point in order to face a subsequent, subsequent waypoint. Lastly, we have the branching factor distribution describing the likelihood of the path branching. These three characteristics define the context based on which our rules for adaptation will be determined. So for a given context, we can express it in terms of these three properties. And conversely, we can generate different contexts by generating different graphs by varying these properties. Let's finally get into the adaptation meta strategy. So we have three different categories of strategies to choose from, but not, not all of them are always applicable in all contexts. When we have no prediction graph available, like if it's an unrestricted open space walking experience, then the planning questions, the planning strategies are out of the question. So we only have one option of general strategies by default. So in this case, the rule is simply to use a general strategy. If the prediction graph is available, but it has branches, then dynamic planning also becomes an option, in which case the question becomes which of the two of these choices works best. And finally, when the graph has no branches, as in it's a linear experience, then all candidates are viable options that we need to pick between based on the context. We'll investigate these two, two cases one at a time. For the case of a branching prediction graph, the problem reduces to general versus dynamic planning. In this analysis, the Earth Center will be representing general strategies and dynamic planning will be represented by force. Let's figure out how exactly we want to go about solving this. Here's a situation. Let's say you have one of your context factors on the x-axis and another factor on the y-axis. What you want to do is sample different points in this space and label each with the strategy that works best. Then you can develop an adaptation rule that classifies strategies based on the context. 
And this is exactly what we did. We measured performance for each strategy across different samples of contact space, context space meaning all sorts of virtual paths. This plot, sh this plot shows the normalized recent count. Um, this plot shows the normalized recent count. So lower values indicate better performance. There's a lot of interesting interactions here, but let's just zoom in on one part of the graph. If you focus on this section, we can see how performance varies across the prediction graphs branching likelihood. In the battle between the strategies, at some point, one of them overtakes the other. And this is exactly the kind of things that help with identifying adaptation rules. What's happening here is that there's so much uncertainty that at some point, it's not worth trying to use planning anymore. And that's the key insight here. The same can be seen with other context factors as well. So after generating the data of performance across context, we use a machine learning algorithm to perform classification and ultimately end up with a simple set of rules that determine when to switch between the strategies. Now for the case of a non-branching graph, all three strategies are available to choose from, namely sear to center, force, and copper. When you look at the performance results across context, you can see how copper absolutely dominates all throughout. So in the case of, and so in this case, the rule is really simple. If you have a non-branching graph, essentially a linear experience, you always use copper. And that concludes our journey for creating the adaptive meta strategy. I do have one bonus slide that I want to show today that will give a bit of insight as to how effective overall adaptive redirection and in general redirection can be. In the worst case scenario with no prediction graph using a general strategy, the performance will be the green curve. With a branching graph, the performance can go all the way up to the red curve. And finally, the results uh, for a non-branching -branch graph using copper are shown in blue. It's important to note that in a 10 by 10 meter physical space, copper can practically avoid resets entirely. This means the average linear experience can be carried out seamlessly without any interruptions in just a 10 by 10 meter space. And this scale can easily be achieved with inside out tracking solutions. Hopefully this definitively sheds some light on the state of the art of redirected walking in a practical and a broad manner. Thank you. I will cheer for myself and hand off to myself again, because you're not tired of hearing me talk just yet, I'm hoping. OK. And more Bloodborne for everyone to appreciate while I switch slides. I'm assuming everyone's here. I, just, I don't even see anyone or anything. Oh, maybe I'm actually we should move this around so no one sees the videos, or maybe they see them. I don't know. I'm going and spoiling this, the fun. OK, perfect. Yes. Once again, thank you. Hello, hi. <laughs> My name is Maddie Osmandion. The title of this talk is Validating Simulation Based Val Sorry, the title of this talk is Validating Simulation Based Evaluation of Redirective Walking Systems. What a mouthful. Before we jump in, I do want to mention that again, I work for Sony Interactive Ent Entertainment. It hasn't changed in the last five minutes, which you might know as PlayStation. I'm part of a team called Magic Lab and we're currently hiring. So if you love playing and designing and thinking about video games, you should check us out. Okay, I'm hoping by now we've all heard of redirected walking in VR and how it aims to keep you walking within physical space boundaries. You've got your unnoticeable tricks like translation, rotation, and curvature gain. And, then, and when those aren't enough, you have resets to turn people around and keep them contained. There's plenty of strategies that use these tools, but we really don't know one, which one is best. And, except I did kind of spoil the, the answer to that question in the previous talk. But anyways, to figure that out, we have to have some kind of a mechanism to measure performance, not to mention define performance, performance to begin with. And that's the issue we're looking at here. We've proposed a framework that uses simulation to run through a given configuration, like a specific redirection strategy, tracking space size, virtual path, and to give you a sense of how it would perform. What we, what we need to know now is what we not to, I'm sorry, what we need to know is to is whether or not this framework is in fact viable. So cue the title card, validating simulation-based evaluation. But first, I think it's worth looking back at where we used to be to appreciate how far we've come. Back in the day, a common way to think of how well a strategy was doing was to see how large a space would be needed to walk on an infinite straight line. This made it seem like sear to orbit was superior to sear to center, and this was confusing. And in some later work, we proved that this was in fact incorrect. Another, another approach involved simulations. So, but they allowed the simulated user to artificially exceed physical space limits. Then they would count the number of times the, the simulated user entered and exited the physical space. And this evaluation is of course flawed because it's based on something that is not possible nor representative of reality. 
Another metric used was the cumulative gains applied during redirection. But when we apply redirection, the gains are typically kept below perceptual thresholds, meaning this metric is practically irrelevant or at least of much lower priority since users don't perceive the gains. It may have cognitive load and that's a secondary factor, but that's something to keep in mind. But you know what people do perceive and grinds their virtual gears? Resets. The fact is the single most undesirable drawback of redirection is the occurrence of resets. Resets interrupt the user's progression and reducing them is the highest priority for improving redirection. That is why we propose defining performance as a function of reset counts. We believe the most intuitive quantitative metric for performance is the ratio of virtual, virtual distance traveled to reset count. This measures the average distance a person walks between consecutive recent resets. With performance defined, let's see why exactly we need our proposed simulation-based evaluation framework. First of all, performance is the result of a variety of interacting factors, which means to tease out the influence of each of these factors, you need to control them systematically. And second, research resets occur infrequently, so we need to have a lot of long, lengthy trials to make fair comparisons between algorithms. This makes it practically impossible to use user studies for evaluations. For an evaluation framework, the main research questions that arise are, first of all, can simulations really represent real user behavior? And second, are performance measurements from this network, from this framework, actually reliable? Before attempting to answer this, it's crucial to understand that the goal here is to measure overall performance of a strategy. This does not mean we need to replicate every aspect of locomotion behavior and biomechanics. We need a representation that has enough fidelity for the purpose of evaluating redirection. So to validate the framework, we conducted a user study that focuses on the interaction of locomotion behavior and redirected walking. Again, not the fidelity of the user simulation. We measured how simulations differ from live users to understand whether or not the evaluation framework is in fact valid. The user study has two main parts, had two main parts. The microscale inspection ins inspected each gain separately to see what exactly causes variations between different users and in contrast to simulation. And the macro, in scale, the macro scale, on the other hand, takes a broader look at how these variations affect the end performance results. This inspection demands extremely detailed analysis, which I'm going to share only key findings from in this talk. This video demonstrates the user study design. We had 30 different users navigate a guided virtual reality experience. As they walked along the, de walked along the designated paths, we measured things like the user's pose, the gains applied, and resets. For the macro, for the micro scale inspection, the key insight I want to show and highlight here is that depending on the manipulation we're applying and how we're applying it, two things can happen. Either only the net change in your pose matters or the accumulated pose change is what counts. In other words, it's either just about the destination or the entire journey. So to communicate what I'm talking about, let's imagine you traverse a path with a 90 degree turn while rotation gain is being applied, a fixed rotation gain. While traversing, if you were to turn your head left and right several times, the rotation gain applied will cancel itself out. All that matters is whether you properly did a 90 degree turn or if you overturned or underturned, and that's what really determines the overall rotation gain you experience. As a side note, it does, however, also matter where you do the turn from, if you do it earlier or late, but I won't go into the, the, the details of that. So this was an example of where the destination, essentially, the, the overall change really matters. But let's imagine the same scenario, but this time we're using a steer to center algorithm to apply rotation gain. So they're, they're no longer fixed. The algorithm applies gains asymmetrically. So it's not fixed anymore, as I mentioned. So it might upscale rotations when you're turning right, but then downscale them while you're turning left, essentially trying to take advantage of any head rotations you have to steer you towards the center of the space. In this case, if you do extra head rotations while you're traveling, it'll cause more manipulations to be applied. So the macro scale inspection gives you some idea of how nuances in your movement influence the redirection being applied. But is this bad? Will it affect performance? We know simulated users and real users are going to have slightly different results, but how would it affect the performance measurements? And that's where the macro scale, macro scale inspection comes in. Here's an example from the data. This shows the virtual trajectory of a sample real user in blue and the simulated user in red. The points where resets were triggered are marked with circles. 
Ideally, we'd like the frequency of these circles along the path to be the same, indicating similar performance for simulated and real users. Ooh, yeah. This graph shows the reset counts for real users in blue and the simulated user in red across different paths and strategies. The first we noticed is that in all cases, the reset counts for the simulation were within the first and third quartiles of real user reset counts. But more importantly, we see that if there's a trend of one strategy being better than the other, this trend also appears in the simulation data. This shows that the simulation for framework does indeed provide us with a valid and economical way of systematic evaluation. There's plenty of nuances that I've glossed over, but the in intuition that I want to leave you with is that even though our natural locking differs from our simplistic simulation, it does cause redirection to behave differently. Overall, our extra motions tend to be beneficial in that they give more opportunities for redirection strategies to use in order to keep us away from the boundaries. That's why simulations offer overall a lower bound on redirection performance for the average user. Thank you. And thank you for sitting through two back-to-back -back talks of me yapping on. Thank you. Back to you, Aika. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Mary. Now we have 10 minutes left for Q&A and there are some questions in the Discord. Um, I'd like to start with a question um, for um, Esteban. Did you encounter any techniques that wouldn't fit into the 2004 taxonomy? Yes, there are a couple that couldn't initially fit in. Uh, basically, these ones were hybrid uh, techniques. So there were a couple of them that had, uh, basically, half of it was about manipulation, and another one was something else combined with uh, teleportation techniques like that. And there were another ones that used redirected walking with something else with another manipulation technique. And those did not initially fit in. Um, eventually what uh, we did was that um, we re reorganized it. And basically um, we determined whether to include them or to not include them in, based on the taxonomy at the moment. Okay. Um, second question to you is, did you find some papers based on eye tracking? Uh, given our initial search, uh, no, not. We found papers more for leaning techniques, but not for eye tracking. Okay. I guess most of them are also then like also in, in yeah, fall in some of the other categories. Like right, yeah. If you use eye tracking for redirected walking, for example, it's a redirected walking um, technique. Um, okay, I have also some questions uh, for Niall. Uh, Kego asks, I would think this result would change if curvature gains, et cetera, were applied. What do you think? Yes, it probably would, or at least the way you do things, you compute this sort of stuff would have to change. It's something we actually tried to do at first, but um, it's not totally clear what the best way, how, how you incorporate that into this sort of model or computation because we don't deal with full paths at least the way we did it we're just sampling points and then comparing the whole space around those points but things like curvature gains will depend a lot on the specific path you walk so it wasn't really totally clear how we could incorporate those into this but uh yeah i think that it, there might there probably is a way but we can think it out but yeah it would change a lot of things i think yeah okay and um Second question to you, uh, do you think one could use your metric to identify a priority list of items in the physical space you should remove? Yeah, for sure. That was something we were like actually looked into and we had to remove it because of page limits. But uh, and you could, I think it's definitely a way that you could automate this sort of stuff. You need to first get this stuff to work in real time. Um, the numbers we computed or had for our computation time, they're pretty bad because we use Python. So if you could port this to a faster language and use multi-threading, I think it would be doable. 
Okay, thanks. Um, then Richard, um, okay. the first one is a pretty long, long. I've, uh, I've read it, so I'll go ahead and answer it. Uh, so Vicky's asking about sort of indoor versus outdoor affordances here. And so I hadn't really considered, you know, looking at indoor versus outdoor in this task, but it does lead to a good point, which is that um, we know that, or at least according to the Siegel and White model, people develop uh, root knowledge first. And that's sort of the knowledge of roots between objects. And what we're looking for is survey knowledge, right? The um, ability to point through those walls. Um, I think it would be interesting to look at indoor versus outdoor because she is right. Uh, you could imagine uh, looking down from the top and seeing those objects in an outdoor environment where you could not do so in an indoor environment. I think in our case, the maze is fairly complex. Um, and I do believe that if people were given this task in an indoor maze, they would still be able to develop that mental model, that sort of top-down mental model for those learners that develop their model that way. Um, she also asked about the validity of the task, the ecological validity. And so I'm a computer scientist. I don't have a, a good understanding of that, but I think it comes down to sort of the path integration and how well learners are able to maybe retrace their roots in their mind. And that's either consciously or unconsciously. Uh, however, I'd recommend looking at uh, Siegel and White 1970, from 1976, uh, sort of the classic, or any of Crastill and Warren's 2011 to 2015 work. And they're probably gonna be the authority on that. And I will post in chat the uh, citations for those when I get a chance. Okay, cool, thanks. And then there's a question from John. Um, I'm interested in hearing you speculate about the causes of the disruption um, associated with resetting. Uh, right, so I think he's referring to the cognitive cost with resetting there. And um, there is some work that's been done by uh, Tabitha Peck and um, it's looked at using a distractor. And we also tried to use that sim a similar distractor to make that rotation more subtle. Um, I think in this experiment, it boils down to like, they're just being such a large number of resets. It sort of stops being distracting and becomes this almost chore um, where people are forced to, you know, either adapt to resetting. They're just turning around and that takes time. So in walking in place, that time is not required. And um, so they're stopping. They're not getting just as much time to explore. Um, so I do think though, the secondary cause, it is possible. And I think sort of Maddie's talk goes into this a lot is that the, path integration, your path integration is much less because you are messing with person's rotational cues and it becomes hard to know, okay, am I walking towards the guitar as I'm exploring this maze or away from the guitar down this path? And um, that actually can be very important in understanding if people are using a root knowledge to say, I turned left, walked five, meet, five feet, turned right, walked five feet, or if they're using some survey knowledge where they are actually keeping track of where things are. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what the cause for it is, but I do think both those questions lead to some very interesting work. Okay, thanks. And one question to John. Um, I'm wondering if you have thought about why remote participants were better with discordant in some conditions. Was it that they had more experience from gaming with teleporting or was it some possibly gender given they were mostly male? Yeah, so uh, this is uh, this is a good opportunity for me to talk about other papers from my lab. <laughs> um, my uh, my graduate student Lucia Cherup um, uh, led a project that we published last year on individual differences in teleporting, and the this was only with lab based participants from a psychology pool. So none of them were VR. Very few people had had VR experience or significant experience. But um, what we found was that. Um, those who were better at perspective taking, so imagining different perspectives more flexibly, um, tended to do better at, in particular, that really difficult teleporting interface. Um, so that's one individual difference I'd point to there. And I'd say it's possible then that our remote participants in this study um, are, are better through some experience or selection, self-selection at doing that kind of perspective taking task. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that people do get better with practice. Um, and I don't think that that discordant interface is one that where, you know, where you teleport to translate and to rotate. I don't think people have a lot of experience with that naturally through most you know, games and such. But, um, but with practice, people certainly do get better. Um, we've been doing some work recently where we give people practice 
and we give them feedback in some cases. Um, and particularly with that difficult teleporting interface, um, they get better with practice and they get better with, with feedback as well. So it's possible then that the remote participants were um, more practiced and have had opportunities to get feedback. So I think those are both um, likely sources for that. Okay, thanks. And uh, one last quick question before we close the session to Maddie. Would the place place requirement for infinite redirect walking apply when the user is moving faster? Maddie? I apologize. I thought I thought we were waiting till <laughs> I just missed you please can you repeat the question, please? Um would the place place requirement for infinite redirected walking apply when the user um is moving faster? Would it affect anything for you're asking if the if the user's velocity like actually influences anything specifically, you're saying? Yeah, I think so. Like the question is from Alex Hobson from, from uh -huh. so Yeah, I mean the, the only thing that I, I do know is that um as far as how currently like like the default way gains are being applied, your velocity doesn't affect it. So if you move faster, you end up being like, it's about the, your overall displacement. If you move faster, you're going to experience the gains faster, but hopefully it shouldn't affect anything. There are some studies that actually have looked at whether your sensitivity will change if you are moving faster or slower. And that's a whole separate thing. And you can be really clever with how you're applying your direction and, and choose to upscale and essentially adjust how aggressively you're going to apply things based on your movement speed. That is a whole thing if you want to fine tune the hell out of it. But most of the time, it's just default. Uh, it's applied in a default way, if that answers the question. Yes. Okay, no. thanks. Cool. Yeah, hope it does. so okay. um, thanks to all of you again. This is really great <laughs> research. We need to close this session now, um, but I really enjoyed it. Um, and of course, you can continue questions and discussion on the Discord um, channel. Perfect. Thank you, Aika. Bye. Bye, everyone.